All right, uh, we're going to go ahead and begin today. So as I mentioned um, last time, as well as on the syllabus, today is a very different um, experience than what we've been doing the past eight weeks. So you're not going to hear me lecture today, and we're not going to talk about any of the books or films that we've been reading or any of the historical documents that we've been looking at today, at least not directly. But rather, we're going to have the opportunity, opportunity to hear w from someone who was actually there. Uh, so this is a unique and I think very special experience uh, for people who haven't had a chance to listen to and dialogue with a Holocaust survivor, this is a unique opportunity. Um, one of the things that I think is uh, exciting about this is that uh, you've been in a class on the Holocaust for the past eight weeks, uh, diligently reading historical documents and watching films, but you haven't actually had a chance to talk to someone. Uh, so today, I'm very grateful to have uh, Dana Schwartz uh, with us today. Um, I, had the, I was fortunate to meet her a couple months ago through an event at the Center for Jewish Studies here at UCLA, and she had come up to me in conversation and said that she wants to and enjoys speaking to young people about the Holocaust. Uh, she's interested in transmitting that memory and uh, I said that I'm teaching a class in, this, in the fall, or sorry, in the winter on the Holocaust. And uh, in the past, I had had survivors come, but in the past couple of years, didn't uh, for various reasons. Um, and I thought that was a really good opportunity uh, to take advantage of. And so we were able to arrange it so that she could come today, tell you about her life story, and also give you the opportunity to ask questions and, uh, and really, um, again, ask things that uh, you wouldn't be able to ask of historical documents or films or works of literature because those things really can't respond to you on a personal level. Um, Dana Schwartz um, was born in Poland, uh, came to the United States uh, after the end of the Second World War. Uh, she worked as a teacher, um, a therapist, and also worked at the Shoah Foundation for many years. As you may know, the Shoah Foundation is one of the largest educational organizations uh, focused on preserving the memory of the Holocaust and also testimonies by people who were survivors, recorded video testimony, uh, which numbers, I believe, over 25,000, is that correct? 52, significantly more than I thought, 52,000 recorded uh, testimonies of survivors talking about their stories, um, all of which will become, is becoming more and more available online and is currently actually hosted at, at USC. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to actually give the floor over to Dana Schwartz. Thank you. Greetings. Um, I do speak as, uh, it, it's, it's, often in the spring because uh, Yom HaShoah, which is uh, the day of memory for the Holocaust, is in the spring. And so uh, a lot of schools teach, it, teach about it. Uh, it's mandated in California in the low grades, I think. How many of you had some experience uh, with, with the Holocaust education in your schools? Good, I'm glad to see it. I hope this works. Um, so I, sorry, I think I'm going to take this off, this bell, I'll clip it back on, I'm fine with that. Yeah, there we go, okay. So my, I have many, many names, uh, only one married name, but many single names. My name is Dana, but my real name is Danusha. I was four and a half, uh, only child of uh, educated, uh, university educated people, lawyers, uh, only child of a middle class, upper middle class family with uh, pretty lace curtains and, and great toys and, it, it, am I sounding all right? It's sort of echoing, okay. And, um, Nannies, I hated nannies, <laughs> but my mother was a very modern woman, and so she, this really, really sounds weird to me, um, she worked part-time, she worked till two o'clock, and so the nannies would take me to the park, and I used to hate that, 
because she, they would never let me run around. They would make me sit in my stroller. And then when I was no longer sitting in the stroller, they would keep me close to them. And I wanted to run. This was a very good thing, a very good training that happened to me. Uh, because later on, I was not allowed to run, and I was not allowed, I was only allowed to hide, and I was already used to it, you know, to just stay down. Anyhow, the nannies uh, were a pain, but uh, one day one of my nannies was sitting in the beautiful, beautiful day on the park, and she was sitting and talking to another nanny, and I had an opportunity to sort of get away a little, and weren't allowed to go on the grass in a Polish park in Lvov, but you were allowed to, you know, just there, there were little, little fences, but you were allowed just to stay on the gravel. But I saw a grass daisy, and I really wanted that grass, grass daisy. And so when no one was looking, I stepped over the wire and I picked the grass daisy naughtily. I was very naughty. And I heard a tremendous boom. And then I knew that God was very angry at me because I had obviously done something terrible. And this was a message for me. And I was absolutely shocked to find out that other people had heard the same boom. I thought it was meant for me only. And people started to run. And a man with it, and I ran back to the nanny quickly, and, and there was a man with a big white dog that ran by and said, go home, the war has started. Look what I had done. I had started the war. <laughs> I was pretty scared. We went home, and then, lo and behold, no more nannies. Parents didn't go to work anymore. I had them all the time. War was wonderful. I even got to sleep with my clothes on because the bombings at night, my father would pick me up and take me along and run down to the cellar. I didn't understand why we had to run to the cellar when there were bombings in Lvov. Because I figured, look, if they throw a bomb on us, it's going to crush the house, and then we won't be able to get out of there. So I didn't understand that either. But of course, you had to go along with it. As a matter of fact, if you had to pee, you had to do it in the drain, right in the middle, with everybody sitting around. It was very mortifying for a four and a half year old. Uh, the Russians came first to my city. Uh, there is a chalk here. I should tell you where in Poland it was. It's in eastern Poland. Doesn't work. You're right. It's fine. It's fine. You can remember. Uh, yeah. Oh, there we are. Thank you very much. How bright. I'm going to turn this down a little bit to stop oh, the... Oh, good. Because there's an echo. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Move this up slightly, I think it'll actually... Sure. To the okay, great. So... It's not the only way to spell it, because it was called Lemberg when it was Austria-Hungary, then it was Lvov with W's, now then it was Lvov in USSR, and now it's Lviv in Ukraine. God knows what it'll be next year. Anyway, there were 150,000 Jews uh, in the city, approximately 150,000 Jews in the environs, in the small towns. Uh, they were all brought in uh, to the ghetto, those who survived, I don't know. Uh, my, my numbers are pretty good, but they're not perfect. So the Russians came in first. It was after the bombings, the Russians came, but before the Russians came even, 
my father, who was a pretty educated guy, said, you know what, I'm going to hire a car and driver and get us out of here. You know, no one would allow you into their country. The visas were impossible to get. But he thought, well, if we go to Romania, Romania is not involved, maybe we can pay off the guards. And so we had this wonderful adventure, as far as I was concerned. With a car, we ran out of petrol. There was a biplane that shot at us, but we ran into the corn and hid. And then we hired a, a uh, buggy, a horse and buggy, and I got to sit in the front with a buggy driver, and it was very exciting. And many interesting and exciting and terrifying things happened. Uh, but I learned a great many things. I learned you could drink an egg if you made a hole in each side and sucked it out. I, I learned all kinds of really kid things. We came to the border of, of Romania, and it was just up the hill. And my mom and dad and I were standing there. My, my mom and dad were discussing it, and my mom said, do you mean to say that we have to leave all our stuff? Our Persian carpet, our beautiful paintings, and the silver we got for our wedding. Everything, all our stuff, just, just leave it and go to another country. And my father said, yes, honey, yes. And they were walking back and forth, and I was staring at them, and they said, they had, I don't know if it was, you know, it was, it was a big discussion, and my mother kept saying, but our stuff, and my father was saying, but, you know, things are, unforeseen things are happening. And my mother won. He said, okay, what are they going to do? Kill all the Jews there, educated people. This is the 20th century. It's the Western world. What's going to happen? All right, let's go back. And we did indeed go back. Uh, at first the Russians came, and my father was taken into the Russian army, and he escaped. How did he escape? He escaped because he was a skier and a tennis player. He was very agile. He was like 32 or say dead by 35. And so he jumped over the fence. And he came back to us. It was wonderful to have him back. And then the Germans came. And we were still in our apartment. And it was tough. And I was accosted. I ran away from a German who had a gun, who was promised me to use it. But I ran anyway, and he didn't have time to use it, or maybe he was, I don't know. Uh, then one day there was a knock on the door and this very beautiful soldier came in all fancy with medals and a great coat over his shoulders and a fancy hat and fancy black boots and he came walking in and behind him his two lieutenants they knocked on the door they wanted to see our apartment and they went around and they said, uh huh, very nice, very nice, yes, very, n okay. Well, be out in a half an hour. Mommy, they, they, they can't do that. But of course they could. And they gave us instructions. Each one can take a small bag and leave. And I had to leave my dolls that opened and closed their eyes and my white teddy bear and all my stuff. I got to take a sweater and another pair of shoes, which I wore from the time I was six to the time I was 10. And so to this day, my toes are not pretty, but I thought everybody's toes looked like that. And we walked out of our apartment and my I noticed my parents' shoulders. They kept them straight up. Shoulders are important. They were quiet. They stared straight ahead. They had me in between them. 
and they were silent, and I knew that my daddy could do anything, but I was so sad to leave. We went to the ghetto. Uh, my father, the ghetto was very, very crowded at the beginning. It was in a very small part of town, and you know how closed in it was, but my father found a room and a half, and he brought with him his mother. And also, at the university, he was very friendly with a twin, two guys who were twins, and they, their father had been a very important man and in, in some kind of government, Senate, Senate kind of a position. And so they knew many people from out of the country, and they had come to him before, uh, just before the war, and said, Dad is dead, Mom's alone, and we were a somebody sent us a visa from Portugal. And we could actually go to Portugal, but we can't leave our mother, can't take her with us. And my dad said, you go, I'll take care of your mother. Whatever needs to be done, I will do it. So when it was time to go to the ghetto, we took Mrs. Bienenstruck. Mrs. Bienenstruck was a very fancy lady. She was used to tea parties with her finger up. And, she, and we, <laughs> that we didn't have any tea parties for her, but we had water and it boiled. And she would say, tea is on. And we would all sit down someplace, and she would stick out her finger, and my dad would wink at me, and I would giggle, and we would have tea parties in the ghetto. Life was tough at the get in the ghetto. Uh, scary, scary. The ghetto kept thinning. So they, 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 there were 300,000 to begin with. And less, and less, and less. Hunger. Uh, on the outside of our building, there were three spots on the wall. We would walk, uh, people would walk, and when they came to the spots, they would walk far away from the spots and then back. And I thought it was so curious, and I know why they did that. I thought it was curious at the beginning. They would grab toddlers and by the ankles, and they would smash them on the smash their heads to see if they could smash it on the first hit. Because then you didn't need bullets. They would also throw kids out of second and third story windows onto the truck or whatever because you could save bullets. Uh, there were actions. You, you know about actions. It's like when I talk to kids in, in lower grades in schools, I explain to them that actions are like roundups, like cowboys round up animals, you know, and herd them into cattle cars. We didn't know where the people were going, but we knew there were actions. One, dad, my, one day my dad came home. You know, we were so starved, and I remember he came home once with a big uh, bread, a bulge under his coat, and it was a big round bread. It was so wonderful to have a bread, and he carved a piece and gave it to me first. And to this day, I remember the taste of that bread. But he came home and he said, an action is coming. And I want to just tell you about one action in the ghetto in Lvov, because I promised myself that I would tell, you, tell people about that, that time. I, by the way, I should tell you that I missed my, my friend Lily very much. Lily was in the old apartment. She was a neighbor, and Lily was about six months older than I, and she was a wonderful friend. She had curly hair and laughing eyes and a great giggle. 
And Lily always knew a little better what to do. She, she, was, she was playing the piano, and she could do a lot of ballet steps. I only knew the first position. This is for the girls here. And, uh, you know, and, uh, and uh, she, my mother used to say, why don't you do it like Lily? But I never quite could. But I loved Lily. And I need to tell you about Lily because that's one of the reasons I speak, sort of in her honor. Uh, Lily uh, fell into a mass grave, clinging to her father's legs as he was shot and fell backwards into the mass grave. And she fell in with him, holding on, not letting go, even though she was not injured. And how I know that is, and another neighbor was in that situation as well and got wounded, pretended to, you know, made himself fall in. And he fell at the top of the bodies, kind of. And when they covered them up, there were pockets of oxygen. And he was able to dig himself out. And we met him after the war and... He's the one that told us how Lily died. But now there was no Lily. There were no friends to play with, and terror stalked us all the time, and Dad said the action is coming. So what to do with the two old ladies? My grandma, who taught me how to warm myself. We had gas and electricity. That means a bulb in the ceiling and gas stove, just the top of the stove. And my grandma would show me how to warm myself like this. It was very cold. And those two ladies had to be hidden someplace. The action was coming. It means they take the Jews out. You've all seen, I'm sure, Schindler's List, how they come in and get everybody out. So what happened to my grandma and the lady, uh, Mrs. Bienenstock, with the, the tea party lady, was that uh, some neighbors decided they had one apartment that had a, a, a larger apartment so that you could they took the last bedroom, they put uh, the old people into the last bedroom, and then they shoved a cupboard in front of the door so that the Nazis would not know there was another room, you know. And, uh, and they found them. I don't know if the floor was discolored, or the wall was discolored, or there was a scratch on the floor. But they were all found and never, never found by us again. For us, my father found, imagine that you're sitting in a courtyard and there are apartments on all sides, and in order to walk into this part, you had to go up three steps and then walk in. And my father found that if you crawled behind the three steps here, you could go sort of into the foundation of the, of the building, and there was, there was like a hole in there, uh, no cement on the bottom, just earth, and about as high as this so that adults couldn't sit up, but I could. I was little. I was, what, six and a half, seven, seven by then. And so in the middle of the night, we crawled in there, and I fell asleep. And I woke up, and we looked like a can of sardines. There were a few people lying just in two rows, or maybe three, I'm not sure. And uh, we had to be, you know, we had to be quiet, of course, because some people in those apartments were not Jewish, and they just could move whenever they wanted to, and 
go take a Jewish apartment, but some people just for some reason or other didn't feel like moving yet or whatever, and they would give us away. You know, that was a very anti-Semitic place, and they could get points. Maybe they could get a better apartment or whatever, or just for the hell of it. So I woke up, and this is how it was. There were pe- no one spoke. We had to be quiet. We had water because people had thrown old bottles under there. And in the middle of the night, at 3 o'clock in the morning, we all used to crawl out, and the adults would all exercise silently. And I would look up at the sky, and there were stars, and I would think, oh, God is so high up, he won't see us and hear me. And uh, we filled our, our water from the spigot, urinating. We just had to pass another bottle around, and people had to turn away. Bowel movements were not necessary with nothing to eat. My father had sugar cubes, and he would pop some sugar cubes in my mouth every day. After a few days, I woke up, and there was a lady, my dad, my mom, some, for some reason at this point I was not lying between them, I was lying next to my mom, and I woke up and there was a lady with a little baby in her breast, two toddlers, and a boy of, I don't know, 12, something like that. Um, Everybody had to be quiet, and having a baby hide with you was the worst thing that could happen to you, because the baby would give you away, right? But this baby was so wan, so, she had no milk left. Would go like this a few times, and just, you know, whatever state it was in, but did not cry. The little kids sat there, I don't know if they were boys or girls, I, I, don't rem- I don't know if I knew at the time even, and they just had these very big, deep, dark eyes, and hollow cheeks and very quiet and sad and they sat next to the mother and there was this boy whom I decided to call David because I had to give him a name in my mind not to him and David kept begging whispering to his mother let me go If dad was here, he would send me to get some food. You see, what teenagers would do, kids would do, is they would lift up the manholes and go into the sewer system and walk out through the sewer system, go into the fields and see if they can find a potato that was left behind or a carrot or something. They would tie their pants at the bottom and stick in the vegetables and come back, go up a manhole. And the Germans knew about that. And they would just stand there. There's a picture. I'm very active at the Los Angeles Museum of the Holocaust. We're just building a new museum at at, uh, Pan Pacific Park. I hope you come. Uh, So there's a picture that the Germans took. They're very proud of themselves. I think you may know that they documented the Holocaust pretty well. So they would see a manhole move, and they would stand there, and the kid would pop up, with, and they would untie. If one piece of food fell out of their pants, they were shot on the spot. Well, this is what David wanted to do. But she you know, it's so Sophie's choice. How, how do you send this kid out into danger to go find some food, or maybe not, or maybe get killed? And so she kept saying, mm-hmm. and he kept tugging at her. 
And I was inches away, and I saw this, this tension between them, this he wanted to save them and she wanted to save him. Finally, one night, she said yes. I don't know how many nights that was, or that we, they were there all together. I can't remember. And he kissed the, the toddlers, and he kissed the still alive little baby, and he kissed his mother, and he left. And I went to sleep. And I woke up in the morning, and she was right here. And her eyes were filled with horror because he hadn't come back. Not then, not the next night, and he never came back. And my mother was totally freaked out. And so she and my father whispered, and she took me with her the next night, and she took me upstairs to the people next door who were not Jewish, who were moving. And she knocked on their door, and she said, this is a story of three rings. She said, I have this ring. Would you take this ring and take my daughter with you for one week and hide her in your new apartment and then bring her back here in a week? And they looked at the ring and they talked among themselves and they said, okay, I'm just seven. Terrified, you know, not, not to be with my mother, but knowing enough to keep my mouth shut. And so she left, told me to be good. I don't know. They put me in the back bedroom and they said, do not walk around. They can see you from the window. They'll know that we're hiding a Jewish child. They sold stationary supplies on the open air market. And so every morning they would leave and I would be in this empty bedroom with, with a, a batch of newspapers in the middle of the floor, no beds or anything like that. And they would leave and I'd be hungry. And they said, do not walk around the apartment, but they didn't say anything about crawling. <laughs> so uh, I crawled around the apartment. Nobody could see me through the window. And I looked at their supplies that they were selling. And they were beautiful yellow pencils and pink erasers and lined paper and squared paper. It was something I could only dream of. It was beautiful. I wouldn't even touch it because I was too guilt-ridden by now doing bad things. So I, I, I couldn't even touch them, but I looked at them. And then I crawled into the kitchen, which is really because I was hungry. And there was nothing there except a huge uh, jar of pickles, pickles in brine. And so I thought, they won't miss a pickle. And so I reached in, and I got a pickle, and I remember how it dripped down my chin. And then I thought, well, maybe they won't even miss two pickles. And so I had two pickles, crawled back in, and waited. They came home every evening, and they made turnip soup. And I am here to recommend to you that if you see it on the menu, please never order turnip soup. <laughs> I ate the turnip soup, <laughs> but it was really bad. Well, seven days go by. I wish I could remember his name. I don't remember his name. The man came in the middle of the day took me by the hand and unceremoniously brought me back to our apartment house and 
put me in the middle of the courtyard and left. He was done. But I was smart. I knew that there were people looking to see where are the Jews hiding? Where, what's this little girl going? How is this little girl going to lead me to the Jews? And so I did this very dramatic thing. I, you know, I pretended to be lost. I walked around and I went to that stairway over there and I looked lost. I covered my face and I said, Daddy, are you still there? Daddy said, thank you for not giving us away. Go to the cellar slowly. Now, uh, backtrack one week, my mother had a week to herself not having to worry about me. So she went to another guy in the same apartment house and said, I have this ring. Would you take this ring and hide me for a week? I, 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 have, to, I have to have some time. I, hide me. And he said, oh, sure. I'll take you to my office outside of the ghetto. He was a tall, handsome, blonde guy. And, you know, if you were a guy, either you were circumcised or you weren't. There was no story because there wasn't a circumcised Christian was not an uncircumcised Jew, so. And they kept checking all the time, you know. Pull it out, let's see. So he was, you know, he was perfectly safe. And early in the morning, they walked out of the ghetto. She pretended to be his lover or something. They walked arm, you know, elbow and elbow. And the the guy at the the guys at the at the openings of the ghetto were you know they knew him and they knew who he was and you know he's just had a big night of love of course go ahead so he went and took her to his office which was one room there was no water there was no toilet he said I'll be, I'll be back with, with food and, and drink for you. I have to lock you in because from the outside. So he put her in, and she waited, and she waited, and he didn't come back. And he didn't come back the next day, and she knew that she would die of thirst, you know. Uh, my mother had grown up in a small village, and she had been a tomboy. She was very pretty, and she, but that had nothing to do with it. Uh, she, and she, she was a tomboy, and she looked outside desperately. It was on the second floor, and there was a tree grew nearby, and a branch came close. Not too close, but close. And she started thinking, what if I lunge at this tree branch? And if I make it, because I'm going to die, he's not coming back. But if I lunge and catch that tree branch, I may make it. And so she did. And she shimmied down the big tree. And now she was in the Aryan section, dying of thirst, hunger, but without papers. You had to have papers. If you were a woman, you had to have papers. I, certainly, everybody had to have papers. But. And she remembered the evil nanny, who wasn't really evil. You know. And she was actually a lovely lady. And my mother saw her name on the outside of an apartment building. And she went upstairs, and she knocked on the door. And she said, Maria, open the door. And she said, what are you doing here? And my mother said, Maria, I'm in trouble, I'm hungry, I'm dead. Could you help me, hide me? And she said, go sit on the top step. My husband will give you away immediately. So when he falls asleep, I'll, I'll take care of you. And so my mother sat there and shivered until the, her husband went to sleep. And she said, come on. And she went and took her into the cellar. And the cellar had many rooms, everybody had a room to themselves to stash all their stuff, like we have garages. 
And she brought her hot potatoes, and she had a folding bed there, and she had a blanket there. And she took care of my mother for several, several days. And my mother loved it. It was dark and quiet and safe, and she slept and she ate until one night, She hears boots, terrible noise, terrible sound. The Nazis, the German soldiers, coming with, uh, come with, with, a, um, with a manager, with a guy, said, open these doors, we're searching for Jews. Even here in, in the Aryan section, we have to see. So he has his keys with him. And he opens one door after the next. And my mother, and she can hear them cocking their guns. So there is no, not even a possibility that they're going to take her away. They're going to shoot her. So she says the prayer that Jews say at their death. And I wasn't particularly religious, but this was it. And uh, they come to her door, and they can't, he says, I can't find the key. Well, where's the key? Well, the lady upstairs must have. Well, go get it then, now. And they're standing there, you know, impatiently, and a dog comes, starts playing with the soldiers, runs away, starts playing with the soldiers, runs away, barks and jumps and runs away. Says, this dog must want to show us something. Come on, let's go see where, the, where he wants to lead us. And as the manager comes down with a key, they say, never mind, and they follow the dog. The dog led them away. A couple of hours later, in the middle of the night, Maria comes down and says, yeah, I could have gotten into trouble. You're terrible trouble. You must leave. And my mother said, yes, of course I, of course I'll leave. Thank you so much, thank you so much. And she leaves. And she comes into the ghetto, and you know coming to the ghetto is very easy. It's getting out that's impossible. And so she walks into the ghetto, and that was the day that I had come. And she had come before me, and she had gone down to the cellar. And when I went down to the cellar, whom did I dream of meeting but my mother, who was there? Shortly after, with money, my father was able to find fake papers for my mother and me. And the fake papers were you know, we had to have fake names and fake religion, right? So my mother used to wake me up at night and say, what is your name? What is your religion? How do you pray? And I had to know everything, and she would teach me and teach me. And uh, we had to find a, a, a name that everybody would know for sure that we were not Jewish. Now, you know Jewish names. Uh, Shapira was my name, which is you know, super Jew. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, it's like Goldberg or something. And that, that would never do, so we had to figure out a name. Well, everybody in the country knew one thing about Jews. They don't eat pig. Jews don't eat pig. It's not kosher. Everybody knew that. So now we decided, my father and mother talked about it a lot, let's find a name that has the word pig in it. So we did. They found some old name that's like Baconovich, you know, Baconovsky, something like that. <laughs> Perfect name. So we wrote that in, and we wrote in my first name, luckily was, was not, you know, a... a 
it was a Polish name, Danusia, Dana, uh, and uh, we had the name. Now he went and he found a man from a small village who was there in the big city on business selling, I don't know what he was selling. And he said, I will give you X amount of money if you take my wife and daughter home with you and you say that she's your cousin's wife and you hate her because she's a city woman. Everybody always hates everybody in the family, you know, so it's easier, more believable. So you hate her because she's a city girl but you love your cousin and your cousin was taken by the Germans or something. Some story. And it was very dramatic. We, uh, we made a transfer. I had to take off my Jewish star. My father had the Jewish star. My mother didn't have the Jewish star on. And we met to say goodbye. And he brought us some bread, which was amazing. And I was not allowed to hug him. Why? The Germans were standing there. He had a Jewish star. I didn't, I didn't have a Jewish star. A non-Jewish girl would hug a Jewish man. You'd know right away, you know. So my mother said, keep your arms down at all times and do not hug your father. And I knew that I was hugging my father probably for the last, not hugging my father probably for the last time. And I remembered, remembered that terrible sadness, but I did not give it away. We went on the train with that man and one suitcase. It was very cloak and dagger, you know, it was very... But we managed it, we got on the train, we pretended to be non-Jews. Uh, he was with our suitcase in another car, and around came a guy who was, I don't know, he was an inspector, but he was a German, but he spoke Polish, but he was looking for Jews, but I don't know who he was. But he was an official, and he patted my head, and he said, what a cute little Jewish girl you are. I am not a Jewish girl. And then I did this whole thing. I was used to being dramatic already. <laughs> and and I, then he said, oh, well, then pray for me. And I said, you know, I said some nasty thing, like I only pray to Jesus and Mary, but I'll, I'll cross myself for you because Maria always used to go by the church and she, from, the, from, from being in the park, and so I knew how to cross myself. My mother had studied it with me. And, and then I said, then he said, but your daddy's a Jewish man, right? And I said, mommy, this man is calling me daddy bad names. I did it perfectly. <laughs> what I didn't know until many years later, didn't put together, is that my mother said to the man, away from the child. She's tired from the germ journey. Come with me. And they disappeared for 20 minutes. And when they came back, he was smiling, and he left us alone. Many such things. Uh, we c came to the village. We pretended all the time. We had no money. We had a, my, my mother had a bag of money that she hung a, a, on her chest because in case you can get caught and pay somebody off to leave you alone, you know. So that was, that was the kind of money this was, not to eat. My mother went to the baker. Oh, so the guy, you know, I don't know if the guy gave us away on the train because he wanted our suitcase or whether it was totally innocent. But anyway, when we got to the town, all his obligation was just to find us some little hole in the wall to live. Uh, you know, totally, almost for no money. Now we had to worry about eating something. We had been in the ghetto, so we were really skinny and not used to eating. And my mother went to the baker and said, you have a beautiful wife, and I have three dresses from the, silk dresses from the city. I have a platinum watch, and I have my engagement ring. I will give you everything. 
all you have to promise me is a piece of bread every day, and you're a baker, so it's, you can do it. And he said, okay. And for three months or more, he fed us. But for three months, I was terrified every day, would he give us bread that day, because that's all we ate. We lived on a farm, and I, I just want to tell you a couple quick stories about that. Uh, when, right when we came, just a few weeks later, there was an action in the town of Zaklikov, which is where we were. And there was, we lived like in an outhouse. You have no idea how simple, boarded up little place it was with, you know, no water, no toilets, no nothing, nothing, just a stack of hay, but that was fine. And the next house had an upstairs, and there was a lady dentist. She was, she was an intern, and she had been sent to this town because there wasn't a dentist there. And her windows were open. And, okay, there was an action, everybody out, you could hear the German soldier came to her room, said, out, you have to be out on the street. She said, excuse me, I'm the only dentist in this town. And maybe you people at headquarters will need me. Maybe you, you need a dentist. And uh, you see, I can't stand up because I just broke my leg and it's not set. And so he said, oh, I see. Well, let me take you downstairs anyway. And he took her by the mattress and he gently took her downstairs to the street because those were his orders. Along came Mr. Mustache. Mr. Mustache, the kids used to talk about Mr. Mustache a lot. Along came Mr. Mustache and he repeated, he says, stand up. And she goes into her story about being the only dentist in the town and the man went. He takes out his gun and he liked to see people writhing in death throws before he killed them, so he shot her here and there and there and there, until she finally died. Uh, that's one story. The other story I want to tell you is about the farmer who did not, believe me, nobody knew who, he were, who we were. Please believe me, except for that one guy who pretended to hardly know us and not like us, but that was a good, good act. Uh, so we lived in this, out, in this, this long sort of uh, house where they, ha they housed uh, different animals and there was one partition for us. And one day I was playing a little bit with his kids. Anyway, it was a cold, cold dark, and stormy night. And I was very quiet and odd. I was always very quiet because I knew I could get into terrible trouble talking. There was a knock on the door. Mr. G opened the door, went to the door, opened the door, and in front of him stood a man with a teenage boy in his arms. And he said, you remember me, I'm Goldberg. We used to trade. I lived up the hill. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. You see, my son has gang. We've been doing fine in the forest for six months. But look, my son's foot has gangrened. And I can't cut it off. I can't cut it off. You know, you die if it gangrene goes up before penicillin. So he said, sit down, sit down. Please get me a doctor, Mr. G. Mr. G put on his dark, his, his heavy coat and went in, out into the blustery night and came back with two Nazis took them away. He got two kilos of sugar per head. His neighbor, Jew. Jews had to be caught and killed. And so they were. 
I just to tell you that we then later lived in another place, and one day, uh, and we lived and we rented one little, not so big, not so small, uh, from the PE teacher of the town who was hap ha happily the mayor of the town for the moment. He had no, he had no power, but he was called the mayor. And again, my mother was ill in bed, and there was a knock on the door. I opened the door. There is Mr. Mustache. The, the blood drained out of my face. I was speechless. He said, hello, little girl. Is the mayor in? He's over there. He went to see the mayor. The mayor later told me that he offered his services. He saw the lady lying in bed with a crucifix above her head. That She was obviously ill. Uh, if you need my car to be driven to the hospital in the next town, it's my pleasure. He was, I mean, the little girl. And of course, we're very polite here. We're, we're civilized people. I'd be glad to help you in any way. It was only the Jews who were vermin and had to be destroyed every last child, every last old lady. We survived till the end. The Russians came. We were starved, starved. A Russian soldier gave us a can of the most wonderful food that saved our lives. We were really, we'd been living in the forest. We were in terrible shape. Starving, starving, starving. Can you imagine that this can of food was the most wonderful thing that ever passed my lips? I can only tell you that I later found out what that food was. It was Spam. <laughs> the Americans had given the Russian soldiers Spam for their, so for their army. And Spam saved my life. I always take my hat off when I, <laughs> when I see Spam. So we went, I, uh, how much time do I have? Oh, great. Okay, because they don't know anything yet. <laughs> we went back to the city of Lvov. I think these uh, numbers were from the Washington Museum, but I'm not 100% sure it was from there. Uh, Everybody who came back looking for their family, looking, looking, looking. So they, they wanted to register, to register. 1,005 people came back out of 300. The week after, or the week and a half after we left the ghetto, it was decimated, it was closed. We just escaped, just in time. But we found no one. We heard stories. We found no one. I heard about Lily. We jumped on the back. We were homeless. We had no food, no possibilities. We jumped on a truck, the back of a truck, and we were able to get out of Lvov, which was becoming the USSR. We went west. Somehow, somehow, we managed. Uh, my, uh, my mother found her, just by, just by amazing mistake, some wonderful, not mistake, amazing occurrence. She found somebody who knew of her old boss who had escaped to come to America. And we found his address. And I forgot to tell you that before we escaped Russia, I was the, I have, I'm proud of myself, so I have to tell you this story. I was 10, 
We were still in Lvov, but the Russians were already there. And one day, my mother uh, was accosted at night by a drunken Russian officer with a gun who wanted to rape her, who was raping her. And I heard her screams from there. It's a long story, but I won't bother you with, with it except to tell you that I ran to save her. I jumped him from the back. I held him by his leather straps. I scratched his face. I kicked him. I said, run, mother, run. And she ran. And I scratched him some more. He was disoriented. I jumped off him, and we made it. So, I mean, there were a lot of, you know, a lot of opportunities for stupidity and heroism. Uh, and uh, anyway, we, we got to the west part of Poland, which had been Germany, which was now Poland. You know, borders changed. Borders are just amazing in Europe. Anyway, this had been Germany. It was now Poland. And the reason I tell you about it is because the kids playing on the street were German kids. And I was 10 years old, and we were poor, and one day my mother gets some money from some organization. It's like $100 in today's money, which is a lot of money for very, very poor people. And my mother says to me, honey, what shall we do with this money? And I said, mommy, do you remember before the war we used to have dinners? We would have soup and a big plate with meat and potatoes and vegetables, and then we'd have dessert, and Daddy would say, and now what's for dinner? And I would laugh, and it was so wonderful. And she said, how do you remember dinners? You, you, you hardly eat anything. How, how do you remember that? And she said, I, I said, I remember that. And she took me by the hand, and she said, look at those children playing downstairs. They're all starving, and you want something so sumptuous. Made me feel guilty. And I said, Mother, the, the fathers of those boys killed my daddy, and I don't care that they're hungry. I want it. And she was very sad, and I probably said something else, because she was very sad, and the next day she went to the open-air market, and she bought bones and barley and vegetables and whatever, and she borrowed a big pot, and she made a huge soup. She took me by the hand downstairs to those German kids that were playing again, and she said, if any of you children are hungry, go home and get a bowl and a spoon and come up to my room. And what do you know? They came. They were hungry. And she fed them. And I fumed. And I always wondered, would my dad have taught me the same lesson? But I remembered the lesson. Many years later, we finally made it here. When the guy was raping her, after I saved her life, she said to me, I'm going to take you. I'm, I'm sick to death of this life. She said, I'm going to take you to a country where you can be any religion you want. You can have any last name you want. You can study whatever you want. You can have friends of any religion. It's okay if you're whatever religion. You can even say that the president has rags in his head and they won't throw you in prison. And then I'm going to take you to a place where it doesn't even snow. <laughs> and I remember I had the same shoes for five or six years. That's not so much fun. And sure enough, it took her five years. She brought me here. And then she died. And I had the most amazing life. I mean, I, I just, you know, I was an orphan at 17, 16, 17, but I, I just, it's, it's really easy to live in this country. Nobody's chasing you. 
You can study. You can even graduate UCLA. You can, you know, it, you, you can, you can have a wonderful life. I, I had a most amazing life. I never went to elementary school, so that's what I wanted. I wanted to teach elementary school, and I did, and the kids and I had a wonderful time together, the children of school. Then I married, and I had three great boys, and strong and happy and not afraid. And uh, I've had amazing opportunities. And you know, I feel like I've heard now so many stories through the Shoah Foundation because I did so many interviews. I wanted to know what happened to all the Jews. I thought I was the last Jews al Jew alive. And then, you know, I, I heard the stories of those people who survived and I knew the stories of all the people, who, some of the people who didn't survive. And I'm always, I'm always thinking, what do they want, do, they must want me to tell David hiding under there, the lady, the baby, my grandmothers, because they were two, just not with us. Uh, my, all my cousins, they got shot in their town. Everybody got <laughs> shot. I feel like I want to tell you that it really happened. I never got to a concentration <coughs> camp. I would, have, I would have stayed there half hour, whatever. But I feel like I, I need to tell the story sometimes. And that's why I came up to you and offered it. And if you have any questions, that, I mean, please ask, whatever it is. Let's have a little, we have a little time. If there's something you, you want to know, just... If, uh, if, I'm, if you don't have a story, I, I have a very quick, charming story to tell you, to leave you with, because if you uh, like movies, uh, there's always uh, sensuality, and forgive me for mentioning the word sex, but this is how my mother and father's boss who was here, who sent us an affidavit so that we could come here. I didn't say that. How did he come here? How did he manage to come here? He was a wealthy man with a wife and daughter and a lover. She, he had a beautiful young girl as a lover. She was German. And the way he came here is that. His girlfriend, Lottie, who was young and beautiful, oh, she was a dancer. She also had her boyfriend from school. He was an older man, sugar daddy kind of guy. And uh, she also had an assignation with her boyfriend from school one day, and he said to her, listen, sweetheart, I can't meet you next week because we, the Nazis, he was a Nazi by then, we are marching on Poland. I don't know if you know that that was a surprise, September 1st, 1939. Nobody knew that the Germans would march on Poland. And so they, he said, I won't be able to see you next week. We're marching on Poland. Secret. She quickly ran to her sugar daddy and said, they're marching on Poland September 1st. And he said, here, take the key to my safety deposit box. Go get all the, my wife's jewelry out of there and all the money and come to my Paris apartment and bring it to me. And you know what she did? She did it. 
she was German. She had no problem. They, they walked in, but she was fine, and she went to the bank, and she put on the 10-carat ring, which I saw later, and, and the diamond bracelet, and the hmm, and the hmm, and she put on her gloves and her coat. She got on the train, went to Paris, knocked on the door. His daughter was there. He, she said, open the door, Ruth, I, kn I know you, and blah, blah, blah. She let her in, not knowing who the lady was. She came in, took off her gloves, dumped the ring, the bracelet, the pin, the money, turned on her foot and walked out. Wouldn't that make a great story? Uh, walked out, and the girl was astounded. Uh, the sugar daddy bought himself and his family tickets to America in 1940 and came here before the Germans got to Paris. And because of that, he was here, and because he was here and was wealthy again from all this stuff, he was able to send us an affidavit. We were able to come. When I was orphaned totally, he was able to pay for my apartment, so part of my apartment, so that I could go to school and, and get educated. I don't know what to say for the end. The end. <laughs> Thank you.